Well, um, I'm talking on uh, cervical TDR and collision sports, and um, there is a consensus that if you're going to operate on these competitive athletes, that um, it's particularly in the high-velocity sports, um, they should be pain-free, they should be neurologically intact, have full strength and have their full range of motion before going back to the sport. Some would argue, is this like turning water into wine? And, and, and with great respect, I think it is in some ways, but by the same token, they're amazingly forgiving individuals. So each group of athletes has dis different expectations um, and challenges. And I think it's important for the surgeon to understand these expectations and inform, um, and inform them whether or not they can return successfully to their chosen sport. Um, I think that as treating surgeons, uh, it's important for us to be uh, manage those expectations appropriately. And um, each group has a different way of approaching protein. So what I do is I look at and assess the athletic career and what's at stake for that given person. I think it's very critical to have a frank and open discussion with them. In general, I find there are three types of athletes, those who think they are, those who possibly could be, and those who are. And they all provide <clears throat> unique and different challenges. It's kind of like the know-alls, the desperate and dateless, and then the real deals. And I've had the good fortune to treat many Olympic and professional athletes. And as I said, they have a whole range of different issues. Because there sometimes can be millions of dollars at stake when dealing with these athletes. And there are outside influences such as their family, agents, coaches, trainers, doctors, owners of the team, not to mention the media and fans. Um, as Vince Lombardi said, football is a contact sport. It's a collision sport. Dancing is a contact sport. So when we look at the sport I've uh, pursued here, rugby union, we've got multiple forms of collisions. It's tackling, rucks and mauls and scrums. And an analysis of one of the Bledslow games played between New Zealand and Australia in 2004, researchers came away with 500 collisions in one game. There were 26 scrums, 200 rucks and mauls and 270 tackles. And of course, the force involved on these player on player clashes related to the speed, the mass, and the duration of impact. So more or less the kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy has been measured. Um, research teams have attempted to look at tackling pressures, basically through uninstrumented training sleds, tackle bags, and more recently putting shoulder pads on that have measurements on them. And uh, we saw in rugby that uh, they can hit with an average force of roughly around 2,000 newtons or over 200 kilos on impact. Now, a, a rugby player will go for your soft bits. He's not going to just go for the hard bit because he's unprotected as well. And if you look at some of the research coming out of the United States with the NFL <laughs> players, they hit with a greater risk, um, a greater force. And uh, that force can be upwards of uh, 3,000 newtons. Um, Basically, what we see there with the different forces is the cushioning effect of impact. I've got some interference there. Can everybody mute yourself if you're listening again so we can hear Matt? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. As I said, um, I'll just go back. Um, the cushioning effect of hitting softer body parts in unprotected rugby players compared to the padded and helmeted American players um, so that, that's an important consideration. While the forces are greater, as I said, we to survive uh, rugby, when you're unprotected, you have to go for the soft bits, so, so to speak. Now, this is a, a front-on view of the Wallaby front row. Now, these guys are all over 125 kilos, and their IQ is less than their weight. And so all these guys want to do is crush you. And it's important to realise the significant stresses that come across these, uh, these situations called a scrum. And these forces can be up to 8,000 newtons. In fact, that central guy there with a the bald head, he can get up to 370 kilograms across his upper body apparatus. So these guys are incredibly fit. And if you look at their shoulders and necks, they have no necks. Now, we had an enormous amount of spinal injuries with this sport. And so 2007, the International Rugby Board changed the rules where we have to crouch, we have to touch, pause and engage. And we did that at all levels of rugby and the incidence of spinal injuries reduced significantly. So that's been a real advance. The forces, each of these packs is over a thousand kilos each. And these are a thousand kilos of, of supreme beef. So the question is, if you get one of these and it's on a cord and or you've got a radiculopathy or myelopathy or both, can you treat it? The answer is yes. What do you use? ACDF, CTDR or or a post-year foraminotomy. And I think the jury's out there. 
Um, there's clinical equipoise between all of those treatments. We've got a variety of devices that have been invented. And I'm once again, I'm not so sure that one device is better than the other. I think you get used to your device. And as you can see, I use the, the keyless ProDessence, which is the top left there. It's got a good macro texture. It's got um, a macro interlock and a micro interlock. And uh, it has served my patients well. Um, these are some of the TDR recipients. Uh, I'm not going to name them, but you can see the top left. He's got one of those extension braces. But all these guys are incredibly fit, and they went back and played their sport. Um, all of these are now retired, um, and they went on to play for several years and fulfill their dreams. This is an example of um, one of another one of my patients, and this gives you an idea about the. Oh, yeah, the video is not transitioning. I'm sorry. It's you'll get you get an idea about the force of contact here, and you can see there there's bodies everywhere, and that's you know they're all over 115 kilos each. Those guys, and um, the impact is quite considerable. Um, you'll see in the, on this front one as it comes through. Well, enough of that. Uh, clearly, the video doesn't work very well. This is another example. Um, and as I said, um, I'm not sure why the video is not transitioning. It was working well in the rehearse. But anyway, as you can see, this is a game of rugby league. The, the ball gets kicked off, and that same player um, comes back, and he gets impacted there and knocked to the ground for good measure. Now, the thing about that guy there is he's got a cervical displacement and a lumbar displacement. And um, the important thing to know, he's not going to change the way he plays. So if you're going to put him back on the paddock, you have to put him back fit and your implant has to be um, optimally placed. So it's about making sure they get their rehabilitation as well. Now, as you know, there's some evidence um, in the literature about the benefit of functional improvement. Um, and uh, Scott's paper, um, as well as Seppi's paper, looks that at functional return, returning to life and, and um, sport, um, essentially, both these papers show that about 94% of people who were involved in sport got back to doing what they, they did. And I'm about to talk about Tuleman's uh, article as well, in which he got uh, uh, members of the armed forces back into play as well. And this was the first and only study looked at um, the extent of military and physical duty by the resumption of 12 soldiers after cervical TDR. Um, they all went back and resumed their very physically demanding duties in life at about 10 weeks. There was no presentation on the outcomes, but they were able to return to work, which was important. So uh, this important paper was produced in 2012 in Clinical Sports, and uh, Kepler and Vaccaro had a look at professional athletes and their high impacts in the C-spine, particularly rugby and American football, and they looked at return to play. Um, and for these contact sports, one level, two level ACDF caused by a fracture or disc herniation was seen as a relative contraindication. Um, and I, I, would, I would argue maybe that's not the case, but it is a consideration, I think is a better word. I think if you have multi-level cervical disease with um, um, narrowing of the canal from a congenital basis, I think then that's a real contraindication because those people get repetitive injuries. Um, but the summation from this was there was just no, no clearly defined logarithm available. Um, other studies looked at professional athletes returning after lumbar discectomy, and we saw this 74 to 90% of people uh, from basketball, football, baseball, um, all returned to their sport following successful treatment of their herniated nucleus. So there are a fair bit of information out there about that. When we look at lumbar surgery um, in athletes, um, following looking at return to play, um, generally it's a... It's an arbitrary decision between your surgeon and, and, and the patient. But basically, convalescence for about two to three months. Um, if it's a contact sport after discectomy, I would look at six months. Um, recurrent herniation otherwise is a big issue. When we look at ACDF, a thousand spine surgeons were asked to um, recommend, make recommendations about convalescence before returning to golf. And there was a consensus of about two to three months. 
Um, Andrews, who's uh, from the UK, he looked at professional rugby union players and uh, after anterior survival spine surgery, and they got most of them back, about 93% went back and returned, and most of them went back within six months and virtually all of them within a year. And as you can see, rugby is a, is a pretty competitive, um, um, high-risk collision sport. Molinari looked at... Um, Molinari looked at um, athletes um, who underwent surgery on the cervical spine and he asked some very important questions. I mean, what port report, proportion returned to play? If they did, what type of operation, how many levels and what type of sport? Um, and of those who went back, um, how long did they continue to play? And did they play at a level that was um, uh, similar to their pre-injury level? And this paper came away with interesting um, assessments, essentially there wasn't much information. There was mainly retrospective observational studies, but they got 175 individuals and um, about 75% of professional athletes were able to return to um, sport and uh, a higher proportion slightly for recreational athletes as well. So most of these professional football players and baseball pitchers returned to their respective sport at a, what they would consider their pre-surgery performance level. Um, so getting anyone back to return to sport after a single level cervical pathology, it, it, it has been examined. So there is information out there. I think these athletes have um, unique demands um, and I think it's a complex uh, decision process to get them back. And I, I don't think there's any consensus whether it be TDR, ACDF or a uh, posterior foraminotomy. But my belief is that uh, it's a quicker return with the cervical TDR. Rinky looked at uh, 46 athletes, um, ranging from professional level to hobby level, and, um, and who resumed return to sport after a single level arthroplasty. And um, essentially there, they had 50 patients in the study, and uh, the conclusion was that cervical TDR did not prohibit return to sporting activities. All the patients recovered and were able to take back their activities at appropriate intensity level. Um, this study, um, was sort of supported by Tuleman studies showing that, you know, you're able to get these active soldiers back to work at a reasonable time frame. So compared to lumbar TDR, which is a return to play about 94%, you get a slightly higher proportion of patients returning to play after cervical TDR. Um, and I think the, the quote you give to your professional athlete is about 70% of chance, you know, you'll get back to that level. And it's a good chance if you do get back to that level, you'll be able to compete at least um, in a similar way that you could pre-injury. Another video, but uh, we'll see if we can we see if it plays. This is that same athlete again um, back on the field. You can see he takes off. He's only got one thing in mind, this guy, and that's to run into that player and hurt him as hard as he can. There's no um, there's no half measures with this chap. And it doesn't look like it's going to play. I'm so sorry. Here he goes. That. Just an abject failure, that. Anyway. Here he goes. Wow. Yeah. There's no love lost there. And as you can see, he's semi-unconscious. <laughs> if you're going to put an implant in the guy, you've got to make sure it goes well. <laughs> That's the other <coughs> Um, I have a transition, there we go, yeah. So in conclusion, I think return to play decisions uh, following cervical spine surgery, if you look at the scientific evidence, it's still controversial. Um, you know, um, I think Scott alluded to before, you don't want to be the leader or you want to be the laggard. I, I just think you've got to be comfortable with your technique and I think you've got to be comfortable with your patient selection. A lot of these people don't have anything else in life um, and it's important for them. And I think when they have these sort of injuries, they realise that their time is coming to a conclusion. But if you can give them one or two or three more years, it really does make a difference because it prepares them to transition. Um, I think there is uh, a lot more sort of uh, literature that we need to look at. I think, um, you know, there has been and there is evidence about successful return with both fusion and TDR. Um, and I think the return to play so it certainly does depend on the cervical spine diagnosis. So what I'm talking about is just really soft tissue herniations with predominantly radiculopathy, plus or minus a little bit of myelopathy, but mainly radiculopathy. I think if you have a myelopathic component, I'm, I'm more likely to fuse. 
Um, I think that's a different kettle of fish. Um, it's only antidotal data that I have there. And I think uh, further um, quality uh, research will be needed. As Vince Lombardi once said, you know, with, with this area, perfection is not attainable. But if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. Thanks very much for your time. I'm sorry about the videos. They just didn't transition the way I wanted. Good stuff. Thank you. And that's great stuff, really. And we so appreciate you sharing at this um, early time uh, your experiences. And again, you're showing us what's ahead of the curve because you're clearly ahead of the curve compared to the U.S. Is there a national spinal injury registry? Is there a registry either through AFL, uh, Rugby League or Rugby Union uh, for uh, spine surgery, for disc replacements uh, of any sorts? Yes. Yeah, we have a uh, spine registry that we're currently creating. But we also have a, um, an AOA, which is the Australian Orthopaedic Association, has a joint registry uh, where we look at all the joints and cervical and lumbar discs are placed on that registry. So that registry, we, we, we monitor what goes on and what comes off. So any, any um, revision procedure is followed. So that's funded by who? By the... That's funded by, it's a complex funding, but prim primarily the government. Okay, that's uh, again, a huge advantage. Uh, let me switch gears towards level specific issues in the cervical spine. So we all know that five, six, closely followed by six, seven are the most common levels, followed by four or five, and then very rarely three, four, two, three, and uh, seven, one. For some reason, I've seemed to have had a lot of contact and collision athletes that have had unusual disc herniations at seven, one, and two, three. Is that just an off thing where they're sent to me and selected because they're so unusual? Or is this something that you've seen as well? Yeah, I haven't seen too much of uh, it, of those. I can actually quote this. I've had two athletes who had C7T1 and both were um, tennis players and they had a they used to play on the clay courts and they had a big kick serve. And I think the hyperextension on these individuals caused that. But um, in terms of 2-3 three and 3-4, three, no, I have not replaced any any athletes at those levels. It's predominantly been 5-6 six, and 6-7 six, and I think one or two four fives. So I've, yeah. Matt, it's Jack. Th thanks for ruining a good night's sleep uh, to be with us. We appreciate it. Uh, Thank Matt, you. I think this in the U.S., the hesitancy might be um, medical legal. You know, it's something we, we haven't really raised that specter, but uh, docs, team docs here in the U.S. <clears throat> are liable, and they have been sued for large amounts of money in the past for post-op infections or, or mal, you know, and not recommending what the player thought was appropriate treatment. So I think the fear for a lot of the team doctors here is if you put it in a, an athlete and he fails or it fails, you're talking about a guy who's making, you know, $20 million a year with uh, who can say I could have played for another 10 years. And you're suddenly you're, you're named in a $200 million lawsuit. Um, do you have the same kind of concerns in Australia? Is there some protection for operating on athletes or? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Excuse me. Um, I, th I think, you know, what you have to do with these particular individuals, you have to consent them out of the game. That's the first thing. Your information highway, uh, what you provide for them. I think you have to have cool off periods. You have to have second opinions and your consent process needs to be extraordinarily good. And then what you've got to do is just back, back your technique and make sure the rehabilitation is, is critical. So these people, I have uh, specific rollouts in the rehabilitation. Uh, what they do, what they can achieve too. And I work with the um, team doctor and, and the team officials on that issue. Um, so, you know, with these contact sports, absolutely no contact in the first three months. And then they can start light contact. And by six months, most of them are confident enough where they can go and do it. But what you're doing the whole time is educating them about their technique. Um, as I said to you before, with one of those slides, the NFL players with the pads and heads, they'll just hit bits. And so we've seen the trouble with some of the American footballers coming across to rugby. They come in and hit you with their head, which hurts you, but it hurts them more. And so with Australian rugby, rugby league, rugby union players, it's all about the technique and hitting those soft bits hard. So they'll aim for your thighs, they'll aim for your abdomen, and they'll go around your ankles as well, but they'll hit you hard. And, um, you know, if you've got the right technique, you clear your head, then you're good. Um, the only time you ever see these guys fall down is when they are heading in for the right tackle, they're crouched and they're just about ready to engage and the opposite player turns and they get caught out. So that can happen even to the best. And I think, if, as I said, I think if you really have rehabilitated them, you've got the prosthesis in beautifully, there's no question about technique, then you're fine from there. Um, we're as litigational as you guys, you know, no question about that. Um, 
well, I just haven't had any um, issues at this stage. As I said, rigorous consent, second opinions, and engage the team and rehabilitate him. They're my, that's my advice. Thank you, Matt. Hey, Matthew, one more question. It's Bay. Uh, great talk. I just want to ask you for your um, rugby players, what about multiple level arthroplasty? Do you hesitate a little bit on maybe you haven't had a case like that, but let's say you did two three levels. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but you do hybrids. Like what, what, what would you plan? Like which, what's your idea there? Yeah. Well, I, um, in that slide I showed you of that some of the TDR recipients, the two in the middle have both had two level replacements. And it's interesting. One of them, um, he was playing in a test match against Argentina and he was a fullback at the time, and he took a high ball, and uh, a guy a player came through and took him out, and he did a reverse somersault and landed on his head, and he was knocked out. And I thought, oh my god, what's happened here? Anyway, he got up, he played on, played another couple of tests. So I think once again, you put these discs in as long as they're integrated and they're well structured. I don't think they're going to come out too easily. You know, these guys have sensational bone. You've just treated a soft tissue lesion. And then, you know, once it's integrated and it's a balanced disc, I, I don't have any um, any issues with it. I mean, I think, you know, as you know, there's some evidence about, you know, um, two-level arthroplasty and compared to two-level fusion and there was superiority. I mean, that was shown with the Moby disc trial. So um, I think we've got to have a look at some of the evidence that does come out with these um, with these uh, randomised trials and, um, uh, and, you know, actually back our technique and back the prostheses. One more question um, uh, for <clears throat> lumbar disc replacements. I was amazed to see this player who had both cervical and lumbar uh, mm -hmm. do you have weightlifting restrictions on those. We have these linemen and uh, they love clean jerks, um, stuff like that. And uh, I think one of the very few failures of the Protus L in the initial trial was a okay. competitive weightlifter who, yeah, yeah powerlift. I don't know what move he did, but he popped it out that it got 350 pounds and he popped the poly out, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, I think it was 600 pounds. Even. 600 pounds, yeah, some absurd weight. So is there a weight limit that you put on the players when uh, you put a lumbar disc in for their training? No, not really. I think James Yu reported that, didn't he? James, I think. I think he did. Yeah, I mean, when you've got that tray slide out, you've got a question about the engagement. Um, like Jack said before, you've got to make sure it's right in there and flush, particularly the pro disc. And I think it was a pro disc at 5-1. I mean, when it comes to um, weights and deadlifts and all that sort of stuff, once again, you've got to go back to the technique. If you look at, um, you know, in all my years of treating athletes, I've only ever treated one weightlifter. Uh, he just happened to be an Olympic gold medalist uh, and used to chase tuna around the world. But he, he was a massive individual. I gave him a pro disc at 5'1 as well. But his technique was just superb. There was no bending of the law doses, buckling, jerking, you know. I think that's if they're going to get back into the heavy weights, it's technique, technique, technique. And um, I think that's really critically important. The other thing, too, with some of these athletes, I mean, you know, it's questionable whether how beneficial some of those deadlifts are in terms of rehabilitating and getting them back on track. There are a lot of different ways you can keep your leg strength up, um, which won't hinder your your um, your productivity on the field. So um, I do have a, a word to the athlete about squats, and I, I don't say you can't do it. I just say you've got to do it properly and it should be monitored. Should I move on? Thanks again, Matthew. My Thank pleasure. You. you guys are awesome. I look forward to future collaborations. Uh, really good stuff, and we got to figure out the videos. Introduce Scott. Scott Blumenthal.